Hey you geeks, this video only contains plot spoilers through Oathbringer, though the larger theory is drawn from the first four books as a whole. Welcome back to Yasna the Einstein, part two, a series devoted to comparing the ten surges, adhesion, gravitation, division, abrasion, progression, illumination, transformation, transportation, cohesion, and tension, the quote, fundamental forces of Roshar, to the fundamental forces of Earth, gravity, electromagnetism, strong atomic force, and weak atomic force. Last time, I theorized that electromagnetism at the quantum level, that is the movement of individual electrons in an atom, is likely to provide the surge of transportations, physics, and philosophy. In order to teleport, Yasna will have to deal with uncertainty and take a gamble. For further details, check out Does Honor Roll Dice? Today, we are looking at the opposition, the force Einstein could never get to play nicely with the others. Gravity. We'll start with how gravity orders space, then consider how the order of space gives rise to musical and moralistic musings. Finally, we'll consider the source of the music, the surge of gravity. The modern theory of gravity begins with Galileo, 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 Galileo by dropping spheres of different masses off the Tower of Pisa and observing that all objects fall at the same rate, Galileo disproved Aristotle's original theory of gravity. This landmark discovery was not controversial, and more importantly, it was right. I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon? And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Though gravity remained centered around the Earth, it wasn't until Kepler discovered that... Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune... Pluto, they're all held in orbit around the sun by gravity. Newton further theorized that gravity was an instantaneous force acting between the centers of large spherical objects like planets and stars. So if the sun disappeared, the Earth would immediately feel a lack of gravitational pull. Einstein revised this view of gravity in his theory of general relativity. According to Einstein, the Earth would not feel the effects of a missing sun for eight minutes. The time it takes the waves, or particles of light and gravity, to travel from the sun to the Earth. Fast as it can go, at the speed of light you know, 12 million miles a minute and that's the fastest speed there is. Importantly for windrunners, the theory of relativity also states that the force due to gravity acts on an object based on its relative position or its relation to the space around it. When standing on Earth and tossing a sphere, it appears to arc. But in space, in free fall, the spheres fly in straight lines. This is why windrunners don't fly. He had to remember that he was falling. This was not flight. In every second he moved, his speed increased. That did not stop the feeling of liberty, of ultimate freedom. This isn't flying, this is falling with style. Windrunners are relativistic physics in miniature. Through lashings, they can order an object to disregard the space around it and do what they tell to do. Lashian's we know is a form of investing an object with stormlight, which we know is a wave and a particle, just like gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity defines gravity as a wave, yet 
Unlike Stormlight, it's practically impossible to hear, even through a radio. Gravity wave frequencies are so faint that no radio could pick them up. In short, Einstein proved the motion of the planets is quite silent. Space is disease and danger wrapped in darkness and silence. Yet Einstein himself thought of it as musical. The theory of relativity occurred to me by intuition, and music is the driving force behind this intuition. My new discovery is the result of musical perception. The music for Einstein was more than just Mozart. It was the music that held the universe together. A music which antiquity attributed to the gods when directing the motion of the celestial spheres. Einstein spoke of the music of the spheres and considered the moral gravitas of the concept. The bonds of gravity. Let's start with a refresher on what the music of the spheres is. I've previously quoted Dante, Socrates, and Pythagoras to explain the concept. Now let's hear from... Cicero. All are joined together by nine orbits or globes, those who roll the everlasting course of the stars. Those eight circuits produce seven distinct sounds at intervals, which learned men imitating with strings and singing open themselves a return to this place, as were others who, with outstanding talents, cultivated the divine pursuits in human life. Cicero held that a person must have some inherent virtue in order to understand the cosmos. Only they could hear the music of the spheres. This divine mantle followed the music of the spheres through Galileo when he was wrongfully charged with heresy because he stated that the sun was the center of the universe. The charge was technically supported by Aristotle's secular scientific model, but misconstrued heliocentrism as contradicting scripture and theology. I think Yasna's original title of heretic was an homage to Galileo. However, Galileo was a member of the Catholic Church, unlike Yasna, who never joined the Voran Church. Also, Galileo plea bargained out of being named a heretic. Though the Roman Inquisition, the Roman Inquisition was not the last to hold scientists to a certain theological standard. Unexpectedly, the latest was Einstein. The fanatical atheists are like slaves who are still feeling the weight of their chains which they have thrown off after a hard struggle. They are creatures who, in their grudge against traditional religion as the opium of the masses, cannot hear the music of the spheres. Hence why this series is called Yasna the Einstein. I don't think they would have gotten along. Einstein would not get along with Yasna just as Einstein did not get along with quantum mechanics. To be clear, I don't think Yasna is a fanatical atheist, but I'm not sure about Einstein. Einstein was chiefly concerned with those who spurned relationships in favor of skepticism. He would have disapproved of her practical philosophy. Relationships were important to Einstein. General relativity is centered on the relationship between space and matter. Space tells matter how to move, and matter tells space how to curve. That's it. A windrunner's morality is likewise relativistic because it is derived from the radiance relationship with those around them. In Words of Radiance, Caledon constantly gripes that he won't be bound to merely Sild's perception of morality. Yet in the end, he agrees with her and swears his next ideal. The bond isn't about what's right and wrong, is it, Sill? It's about what you see as right and wrong. What 
we see, she corrected, and about odes. A windrunner's morality is formed by his relation with his spren, just as an object in space's direction is chosen by its relation with the larger objects around it. Though a windrunner has free will, unlike the moon, which does not. Relationships are also key to Einstein's understanding of the music of the spheres. For Einstein, the pre-established harmony of phenomena and theoretical principles is essential for uniting quantum theory with electrodynamics and mechanics in a single logical system. Like Dalinar, Einstein's ultimate quest was to unite them. And we're picking up where Einstein left off in his quest for unification. For Einstein, this meant uniting Earth's fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak atomic forces into one mathematical equation, a quest Einstein tragically died before achieving. The strings. Einstein definitively proved that the motion of the planets is, for all intents and purposes, silent. Yet he still heard music, as does Sanderson. Clearly inspired by real physics, investiture is reliant on tones, waves, and lights. So where in physics is the music? Where's the band? Music can be found in two places. First, plasma waves emitted from the sun that play each planet's Van Allen belts like giant harp strings, creating the polar auroras giving each planet its own song. Okay, maybe not that song. It's more ethereal. Yet the music of auroras appears on most planets and tracks well with both ancient and medieval interpretations of the music of the spheres. The motion and the power of the holy spheres necessarily must breathe from the blessed movers. The first light, which irradiates them all, is received in as many different modes by them as there are splendors to which it appears. This fits nicely with all the other divine comedy images Sanderson has made in the Stormlight Archive. It also has the best little Easter egg for Yasna's gamble. For you see, NASA launches rockets into the Aurora Borealis from a site called Poker Flat. The other option is, of course, string theory, which Sanderson himself has said inspired the magic system. Investiture with its deep inherent connection uh, to sounds, tones, rhythms, inspired by a sort of magical version of string theory and its idea of vibrating strings making up everything. Yes. Yes. Um, um, a, a direct inspiration. The music of string theory may mechanically prove to unite radiant surges, just as science at its best has been the common ground between the theist and the atheist. For example, both Father Georges Lemata and Stephen Hawking theorized the Big Bang. Although they certainly had their differences, they both could agree on math. But no poet has yet to write the myth or moral of string theory. Or should I say, no poet has yet finished the myth of string theory. With tuppence for paper and strings. To mythologize string theory, Sanderson has started with Einstein's theory of relativity, and to a certain extent, the natural law morality Einstein imbued within it. Yet Sanderson must go beyond Einstein and show that Yasna can hear the music of the spheres. He does this by presenting a common ideal that anyone can uphold. Life before death, strength before weakness, journey before destination. This is what I love about this fandom. It contains so many people whose views differ greatly from my own. Yet we can all agree on the first ideal. 
and have built a community on that. If I can find common ground with Sanderson over Dante and Einstein, even though we approach them through two distinct directions, then I can hope that uniting gravity and quantum mechanics will result in a morality that will defeat odium. And maybe the Else Callers and Windrunners will learn to get along. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.